Welcome to The Frenzy. I'm Melissa Carter. And I'm Jen Hobby. The Frenzy is here to change the conversation around age. So that you can celebrate all your years rather than lie about them. We are ready to share an honest and humorous take on what it means to claim your real age while rejoicing in it. I'm Melissa Carter, and just a few days ago, I ate a whole box of Tagalongs in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and amazed that I could still do it. <laughs> I'm Jen, and my brother Matt is a Hollywood actor and stars in CBS's Young Sheldon. And I'm a proud big sis. He's the preacher man. He's the preacher man that you love so much. My name is Jen Hobby Rivera, and professionally, I work in radio and television. So my entire career has been based on digging for good stories, telling compelling stories, and witnessing stories breed miracles. Friends, coming up on today's show, we have a different format for you. Yes, that's right. Today, we're going to dive into Jen's TEDx talk. I'm so excited for her. It was officially released on the TEDx YouTube channel, and that is a big deal because they are only handpicked. They handpick a few uh, from the each of the TEDx talks uh, to share, and Jen was one of them. So, so proud of our girl. And Melissa doesn't know it, but she's going to be in the hot seat from the TED Talk. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> it's going to be much easier to talk about your story than my story. <laughs> Plus... What? No, it's yes. <laughs> of course it is, Jen. Go ahead. Put you in the hot seat. And uh, <laughs> Melissa has a pep talk for your week that is going to get you motivated. I can't wait for that. So that is all on the way. Friends, we want to ask you if you have subscribed to the Frenzy podcast yet. Why not? It's totally free. And if you're enjoying it, have you told a friend about the Frenzy? It would really mean a lot to us if you shared an episode. Now, before we get into our opening chat, I just want to share my T-shirt, okay? It says 1970 Vintage. Yeah, girl. Okay, because my birthday was last week. I turned 51. I'm officially 51 now. Happy but birthday. Thanks. But remember, a few episodes back, we talked about how my, my uh, teenage clothing was vintage, right? So I'm having to embrace the word vintage. So I just want everybody to know that I'm embracing in fact, <laughs> that I'm vintage. Awesome. I want my year. That's so, cool. Yes. And you what is your, what you got to share in the show notes where you bought your t-shirt? I know. I will. I will. Um, uh, wh what's your year? 77. 77. Oh, see, I like that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Seven. That's, that's very lucky. <laughs> um, so speaking of lucky, let's dive in to this Ted talk. I'm so proud of you, Jen. Explain to people the fact that you did it and what it's about. And let's talk about it. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're like famous. I mean, like you're already famous, but now you're like, like no. legitimate famous, legit famous, Not legit really. fam. No. So, <laughs> so there's an event, a TEDx event in the Atlanta area where Melissa and I live. Uh, it was called TEDx Alpharetta Women. And a woman who was putting together the event had been a radio listener of mine. And she reached out and just said, hey, I think you would be great at this. Would you want to do a TED Talk? At which point I barfed and then <laughs> said yes. Really? I said yes before I had any idea what I was saying yes to. And then it became a months long process of determining the talk, writing the talk, memorizing the talk. They gave us speaker coaches that were amazing. So it was this long process. But basically a TED Talk is about highlighting new ideas and bringing them to light. And that's the mission of TED. And doesn't um, it, TED stand for something not to interrupt you, but TED yes. stands for like technology, entertainment and design. Gotcha. Okay. And it's about giving folks the chance to bring just new ideas to the surface. Let's talk about new ideas in all kinds of different areas. And so this one was all women on the stage and their goal was seek. That was okay. the overarching theme. It was okay. called seek. And so, um, so they do, they tell you like, okay, here's our theme, go for it, like run with it. Yes. And they okay. worked with each and every one of us on how our talk would fall underneath this seek umbrella. And so a Sweeney, who was the woman who was coordinating the whole thing was asking me, like, what are you seeking? And what are the things coming up in your life for that? And so where I started was seeking a new definition of success. So okay. that was the seed of the idea is 
we've been taught for a long time what success is supposed to look like. There's this old success model. And I thought, what if instead of that success model that has to do with titles, money, achievement, awards, those things that are set up that we're supposed to go reach for in our life, what if instead our success could be based on our story and how we're mm. sharing that with the world? So that's where I started with the seed of the idea and just really dove into it and talked about how your story is at the root of your success. And could we instead define how well we're doing by how much we're sharing our story? And I compared it to sound energy. So sound energy, you know, as a radio and podcaster yes. persons, mm -hmm. we <laughs> know about sound energy and yeah. sound energy travels in waves and it's measured in frequency and amplitude. So could you, instead of measuring yourself on this old success ladder, could you measure your success by how much frequency and amplitude you're giving to your story to serve the world? I love this. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty dense. It's 13 minutes memorized. I can't tell you how many times I stood in my living room talking to my iPhone, practicing it. <laughs> so uh, it, it, when people have seen TED, because I'm sure most of our audience has seen a TED talk. Yeah. You see other people give speeches and a lot of times they'll have notes or they'll have those, you know, clear screens where they have their scripts. Like you see the president, I, I think of the president, you know, all the presidents have those. There's no, nothing for no, you. So no. all those TED people have memorized every single thing. Memorized they're talking. That's it's, amazing. It's part of the rules of TED. So there's very strict rules that you have to follow. And one of them is that there's no notes and no teleprompter. Not allowed. Wow. Okay. And they put a red dot a red carpeted dot on the stage. And for mine, I did my talk during COVID. There was no audience. So it was the sound crew and the camera crew and the event. So there's no, inter there's no, you can't feed. Cause if you do public oh. speaking, like Jen and I do yeah. one of the, you know, a lot of people are afraid of it, but one of the beauties of it is you get, you, you talk about energy, you get energy from the audience and you get motivated and you kind of ramp up because there's people in the audience reacting to what you're saying, but you're looking at seats and, and people in the very back trying to just, technically make sure everything's okay. Yes. Wow. And I will say to the crew that put together the TEDx Alpharetta women, they were amazing. And they did the head nods, right? They're acknowledging. They're trying to they help. Trying like, to give you that <laughs> audience energy. But there was, you know, it was COVID. We all had to be very careful. Everybody was wearing masks. I was wearing a mask up until the moment I had to check my lipstick real quick before getting on the stage. But it, they were very COVID compliant about the whole thing. Um, but yes, it had to be, it has to be under, it had to be under 14 minutes memorized. So wow. I remember your anxiety with this. I mean, it, we, it, I, I tried to help pump her up in the, in the behind the scenes, but um, yeah, I, well, I mean, if you know what you're talking about, but still, you know, just the idea of 13 minutes, it's one thing to talk for five minutes about something you know about and you can get through it, but 13 minutes, I mean, that's the, um, in radio terms, that was what three, four, Four songs, four full songs. <laughs> yeah, talking you know, the whole time. The talking and I the whole time. I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any parts of it, right? Because I had carefully crafted the intent and then storytelling within it. So mm. if I'm doing a TED talk about your story, finding your story and sharing <laughs> it with the world, I better share some stories, right? right? I better yes. have some good stories to share within there. And so I wanted to make sure that I went in the right order and that the nerves didn't take over so that I, so that I made the point. And what I will say I'm thrilled about is that I don't look as nervous as I felt. I felt so nervous going up there that day. I had had tummy troubles, you know, the, the tummy nerves. And then getting on stage, my mouth went dry and I've never had that happen before. So mm. I was really afraid that was coming off during the speech. So as we I'm call that pop, we call that popcorn mouth and radio. Yeah. It's like, as, as I was delivering it, I was going, okay, I'm really hope. And you know, the other part of your brain, your thought, nervous thoughts are going, well, I really hope you're not coming off nervous because you're nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the reason we call it popcorn mouth is because when your mouth is dry and you're talking, it kind of crackles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah, that's something that in, in the radio world is awful because you're right on the mic. But I could see where you're <laughs> you're there and you're having to, there's so much in your head because because yeah. for me, I would also be terrified of body. So, I, you know, one of the things I did a 
play once as a, and I got paid for it, but it was a, I knew the playwright and he created this character based on me as, you know, listening to us on the radio. And so he wanted me to play the character. And one of the things I realized I spent my whole life doing what we're doing here, which is just having to worry about my head, having to worry about my voice. That's all. I don't have to worry about my shoulders and my torso and my legs and my arms and what to do with. And when you are on television, it's usually the waist up. But when you're on stage, it's your from your head to toe. So you, you're you yeah. thinking about your whole body movement. You're thinking about the 13 minutes of script that you have to keep in your head. And you're thinking about the fact that your mouth is dry. And, you know, hopefully your <laughs> tummy's not rumbling at that point because that, right. you know, you don't want to have to toot on stage in the middle of doing all this. So bless your heart. So, I mean, how do you, it, the body, how, what did you do with your body? Are you used to that? I mean, were you a dancer no. or anything? Were you, because usually was, dancers are good about that. No, not a dancer, but I was in theater in high school. So that helped with some stage presence and blocking and knowing that sort of thing. But that's where the speaker coaches really help is that you record yourself, you send it to them, they give you feedback. So it's a long rehearsal process. And then they did let us before the actual recorded talk, they let us come the weekend before and rehearse it. So you got to get on the stage one time before, be in the same room one time before, deliver it on the stage, work through any things that you needed to, and then you came back to deliver. Because the other rule of TED is that there's no do-overs. Like they turn yeah. on a timer. So there's a timer clock in front of you counting down, and there's like this red light that came on. So as soon as the light comes on, you're on, and you get one shot. That's it. <laughs> and if you screw up, then then you screw. Up. And there were a couple of places in the talk. If you go and watch it on YouTube and we can put the link in our show notes Absolutely. to go and check it out. You'll see I stumble over some words, but that's where the radio training comes in is if you live, you're live. That's you right. You keep going. going. <laughs> that's right. You you feel right? that you feel, you pull it at your butt, but you keep going. That's right. You keep rolling with it. So I was glad to have that training in that moment. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so proud of you cuz I mean that's so fun. I mean, well, for everybody else okay. to be able to watch let's, it. So let's see if you still say that after I put you in the hot seat. Okay? okay. Because the mission of my TED talk and the name of it is stop bottling up your story. The okay. world needs you. Okay. okay. So I'm I about to it. put Melissa in the hot seat to go through because in my talk, I give you homework. Okay. So we're going to go through all the exercises together. Well, you love homework. You love and notes and homework. You're very, <laughs> you're very, uh, you, uh, yeah, you're very noty girl. <laughs> We're going to draw out <laughs> Melissa's story okay. and talk about how the world needs her story. And mm. for our frenzy listeners, I want you to think about your story. So as I'm going through it with Melissa, I want to think, I want you to think about what are your answers to these questions. Okay. So we're going to dive headfirst into that in just a second. Okay. But first, let's thank our sponsor. So how do we do this? First, we got to find your story. Now, that's pretty daunting of a task, right? It's like looking at a blank page and somebody saying, write a novel right now. You go, ah, panic. I don't know what to do. Well, I want you to answer these three simple questions, and we're going to find the seed of your story. Okay, Melissa Carter, I'm about to TEDx talk you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, girl. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a long time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called Stop Bottling Up Your Story, The World Needs You. Mm -hmm. Because I really do feel and believe in my heart of hearts that your story is why you're here. And it's not meant to live with just you. That, you, that we are put here to experience things, go through life, and share that experience to serve others in this world. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go viral. That doesn't mean you need to have a podcast like The Frenzy or a goofy radio show with wacky sound effects, <laughs> right, in order to have an important story. Right. You listening right now have an important story to share with the world. And I think it's a way that you can reframe defining your success. So reframing and redefining for yourself, what is success in my life? Is it that, you know, I've done this job, I have this family, I've been a good friend. What is it that allows you to define success? To me, it all comes back to your story. So I was very okay. passionate about this talk because I really, truly, in my heart of hearts, believe it. So I think you're on, I mean, I, I think it's a brilliant topic and I think you're on to something that's absolutely true because when people think about you're here for, you know, am I here for a reason? Are we here for a reason? Well, 
through storytelling, I'm sure that the point is that you're so unique. Like it shows how you're set apart by the story you tell. Okay. Okay. Right, I won't be nervous. So in order Here to do go. this, we've got to find your story, right? Okay. And that seems pretty daunting to do. It's like, you know, I said in the talk, you sit down in front of a blank screen and you're like, ah, I can't write a book. What would I write about? Mm -hmm. But if you break it down a little bit more than you can. So there are three questions that I ask mm -hmm. in the talk. And the first one is, what is the toughest thing that you have been through? My because, kidney, oh, I'm sorry. Can I answer or do yes? I need to wait? Uh, my kidney disease. Okay. That is the toughest thing that you have ever been through because you survived it. Mm -hmm. That struggle was in place. It was the, it was what led up to it. it. It's what led up to the survival. It's the, um, it's being diagnosed. It's the denial. It's the, because when I was diagnosed, I mean, do you want me to go deep this deep yeah. into it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I was diagnosed at 27. I had no symptoms. It was another reason. So I, uh, I was getting sick with a regular cold. And when you go into the doctor's office and they have you pee in a cup, there's a reason they have you pee in a cup because they're checking your kidney function. And when I went in to pee in the cup, um, that's when they found something. And then they took my blood pressure and my blood pressure was off. Your kidney uh, regulates your blood pressure. And so that's another symptom. So um, they told me then that something is really wrong and you need to go see somebody. So that's at 27. Um, it was, I went through the fear, mm -hmm. but still didn't want to tell anybody. I was I'm a very private person. So when I go through something, usually I hold it close to my chest in the beginning. And then, um, yeah, so it's the process of the loneliness of being diagnosed with something, the realization that they're not full, you know, full of crap, that something's really wrong. Mm -hmm. The fact that my life was in danger. Um, and going through a doctor I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with and had to replace that doctor with somebody else. You know, it was just, it was four years of uh, a lot of soul searching and a lot of, and, and a fear that shook me out of my insecurity. I will tell you, I, I learned my um, survival instinct at that point too, because I used to be a fearful, shy, um, in very insecure person leading up to that. And that, I I took the road of strength and survival and have never looked back. So yes, I would say that that was the hardest thing I've been through. In the four years, was that four years up until your transplant? Um, uh, yes, four years up to my transplant, and then the tran yeah the transplant was the easy part. Okay, tell us about the transplant. If somebody's just now discovering your story, yeah. So I uh, in two thousand one, I was thirty one years old, and I November uh, uh, November. <laughs> hold on, November eighth. <laughs> I was gonna say November seventh. Uh, November eighth in two thousand and one. Um, I my cousin Pam decided that she wanted to be my kidney donor, a living donor. I hadn't seen Pam in, since I was fourteen years old. Um, and she, when she heard, I told my mother, my mother told her sister, her sister was my cousin's grandmother. So it's a first cousin once removed. And my cousin said, well, you never get much, you, you rarely get a chance in life to truly make a difference in someone else's life. And so she said, that's the reason I called you. She called me after hearing it from her grandmother that something was going on. And she was a near perfect match. Wow. So she lives. That's amazing. Yeah. And so she lives in Bend, Oregon. If if you're a hippy dippy and you are an athletic person, that's the place to go because it's such a cool place. But she lives in Bend, Oregon. She flew to Atlanta um, the morning of the transplant. The uh, National Kidney Foundation, who I'd been working with, because I was on the radio when all this was going on. And I wanted to share my story uh, on the radio. And I worked with the National Kidney Foundation. They sent a limo to the radio station um, and every, uh, and this would bring tears. And so the morning of the transplant, everybody wore orange and white um, for university of Tennessee, the colors to, in honor of me and not just the people on the Burt show where we were, but it was the people at 99 X, the morning X um, everybody down the hall wore orange and white. And so they got me a limo. My we went to pick up my cousin 
um, who was staying at my place. She wasn't going to get up and come to the radio station. She was sleeping in. And then we, <laughs> she's like, I'm doing enough already for <laughs> this. Because the surgery was like at one uh, in the afternoon. And so we went. And I just remember the waiting room to be checked in for surgery because I was shaking. Um, I was grateful. But I was scared because there was the possibility I wasn't going to wake up from it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was facing death. It was facing, I'm going to be put to sleep and this may be it. And um, so I, I just, but I was Melissa, funny Melissa, making jokes, making everybody else feel comfortable uh, in the room. My mother was there. My girlfriend was there. Uh, my cousin was there. Uh, those are the people I remember <laughs> being there. Mm -hmm. I had several friends that showed up and family members. I had an aunt from Florida that drove up, but they didn't get there till after we were taken back. So I didn't, I, uh, I didn't see everybody that was in the waiting room because the surgery was like six hours long. So my aunt, who's my late, my father had already passed away. So my late father's sister came to be with my mother during the surgery. And um, so anyway, I just remember having cold hands and shaking as I was filling out the the form and not believing what was happening. And I went back to that denial that went back, that surreal moment of um, that. I can't believe this is what I have to face. And it's, it's, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian environment and my grandfather uh, had a picture by his bedside um, that of Jesus when he was praying to ask the cup being taken from him. And I got that from my grandfather. I kept that picture. I still have it because I just, for some reason as a child, I felt that was the most relatable, one of the most relatable moments, I think, in the life of Jesus for humans. Um, and that's how I felt then. I felt for a moment, I felt like I don't want to have to do this. I don't want to, even though I've, after everything I've been through, I thought I don't want to have to um, let this cup pass because I don't want to face this. I'm too afraid. And then there's a moment where you shake it off. And it's like, you don't have a choice. You got to do it. And so you get up from that rock because the picture is of Jesus praying at a rock and you get up from that rock and you, and you face the music. And so, um, Fortunately, if you've never had surgery, uh, hospitals have what I call happy juice. So they they purposely give you intravenously, they give you something to relax you before surgery. So you're, you know, you're chill when it ha when the moment comes. So once I got the happy juice, I was in there with my mother and I felt a lot better. I can't tell you what she felt, bless her heart. But I uh, now as a mother, I can I I have a lot more um, empathy for that moment than I did then. And so, yeah. And then I rolled back into the operating room and the way they do a transplant is they prep the donor first because um, they're trying to match the surgeries because they're having to literally take the kidney out of her body and stick it into mine. So it's outside the body only for <laughs> a, ha a minute. Wow. Um, and so they had already prepped my cousin and was already working on her. And then they rolled me in. I didn't see her. They rolled me in. Um, I guess that there was a partition and I remember the doctor who was a wonderful man, uh, asked me, he said, what radio station do you want to listen to? Or what music do you want to listen to? And I said, honey, you're the one doing the work. You listen to whatever you want to listen right. to, to make this work, to make this right. And we laughed and then they gave me, they said, okay, we're going to put this on your face and you breathe for 10 seconds. And I made it too. And I was out. Um, so I, and I woke up. And I remember, and I, I don't do well with anesthesia. So I, I know that when I wake up from surgery, I'm, that's the, for me, it's the worst moment because it's just disorienting and sometimes I get sick. And so, uh, but I remember waking up and kind of telling myself that even, you know, even though I, I was feeling, I, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was, but in my mind, I thought I'm waking up. You know, like I'm I, alive. I'm alive. So, and I and I wanted so it's one of those things where I wanted so badly to shake off the anesthesia because I wanted to 
celebrate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I eventually did. So that, that, um, and then I, I was really sick the rest of the day. Um, cause I, <laughs> the woman I was dating at the time, well, my brother, uh, had arrived and he was in the room with me, but he's such a sweet man. Bless his heart. I know he's scared to death to see me like that, but I was, I looked really rough and because I was very underweight and then I had just been through surgery. So my color wasn't good. And I mean, still on the anesthesia, but I, um, he was at my bedside, I remember. And then he was leaving and then my girlfriend came in (laughs) and then I remember a nurse coming in and I told the nurse, I said, I, I may need you to grab me the trash can because I think I'm feeling a little queasy. And then I don't remember much else. I'd blacked out, but I had been sick. I was stayed sick the entire night (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I don't remember it. But the doctor explained that it wasn't the anesthesia. I thought it was the anesthesia. I thought I've never had this reaction like that. And he said, no, it was your new kidney working. He said, you were so, you were, you were filled with so much toxins that your new kidney immediately started working and was trying to clean you out. And I literally blacked out while the kidney was cleansing me. And then the next morning I felt like, a hun- I mean, a thousand bucks, a million bucks. I was eating breakfast. I was, my color. I, wow. I had the surgery in November and I had been, you know, I still did things. I still traveled. I still went to the beach, even though I was on dialysis. And my tan came in the next day. <laughs> like I, my color was so good that my body was so sick. I couldn't you know, the pigment just, it couldn't give the energy to the pigment. My tan came in the next day and then I started my period the next day. I hadn't had a period in nine months. Wow. And I started my period the next day and I, that period lasted two weeks because I hadn't had a period in so long. So it was just, um, it, it was amazing the transformation. And even though I was, you know, having a period and stuff, I, it, it was just, it was a beautiful, I, I, it was the best orange juice I'd ever drank. It was the best eggs and hash browns I'd ever had. Um, it's a it, miracle. Yeah. You yeah. experienced a miracle. Yeah. And, and it's so that, really yeah. from the inside out, right? Like right. that's what's, that's so, this story is amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. And so, so, you know, the toughest thing you've been through you made, me, you made me cry Whatever. and sharing <laughs> that. Thank you for reliving it, especially with health struggles. I know it's so hard to go back there and relive them again. Well, it's a but lonely there's... experience. It's a lonely, mm-hmm. disorienting experience. Um, and I and yeah, and I think that's why it's so hard is because most everything else in life, you have you have people who know what it's been. Most people have gone through it. So like if you're pregnant and have, you know, children, most, most women have had children. If you can't conceive, there's plenty of people who can't conceive. They're right there with you. It, you know, and it's not that not, there's plenty of people who've had kidney transplants, but that's not, that was something I had to seek out. Like I didn't have any friends that had kidney problems. I didn't know anybody that had kidney problems. Um, and so it was just, it's just, that's what it is. It's you have to, especially when it's a life threatening thing you facing death is such a odd it's not a it's not a scary experience that's the thing it's like people think it's oh this grim reaper comes and you're scared to death no it's a it's a i don't a grounding like mm-hmm. it, you're grounded in your humanity it's it's a it's a transforming it, it truly transformed me it, it, from the inside out physically and mentally and spiritually like it it really i've haven't been the same since that experience and i'm glad because i wasn't a i i wasn't a, um the person i needed to be before the transplant and there are so many stories that define us so through this talk and through some of the questions that i ask in it is to unearth your story yours comes quickly, right? You knew, I mean, before I even finished right. asking the question, you were like, kidney <laughs> transplant, kidney yeah. disease, you know, but I also think there are other parts of your story that are struggles, which is what makes you such a dynamic human being. Um, I would say as your friend, like coming out and being one of the only or the only one out person on the radio in Atlanta for a long time, mm-hmm. that had to be a serious struggle to one be of public the first- with your sexuality. One of the first in the country, too, I, I learned. 
Um, Crazy. I got a job at, on a national show called Ready with a Twist, where Dennis Hensley, who uh, has sponsored the show, mm -hmm. um, and I, and the reason is because they couldn't find an out lesbian. Like they were searching, so they found me um, through a, a through a relative of a staff member who lived in Atlanta and heard they were trying to find a lesbian for a radio show. And she's like, "Well, I'm listening to a lesbian on a radio show in Atlanta." because they couldn't find one. And this is people in New York. So New York was like trying in, in LA and Chicago, they were trying to find an out lesbian for this show that was geared toward the LGBT community. And I'm just the only one. I mean, I'm grateful, but it just, it, yeah, it's still, I still, I don't know if there's any, there's certainly not in Atlanta that are out. <laughs> right. Know? Right. Okay. So we've identified two huge struggles. We already have two books. Ready for Melissa to write. Okay. Um, and then I think you could also talk about your son coming into the world. Yeah. That's yeah, another big part of your story. So when you think about your struggles, and I want our listeners to really think about when you think about your struggles, it's not just one. There's been things you've gone through in your life and survived that were hard, but you figured out a way to survive it because you're hearing this message right now, or you're still right. here to hear it. So what did you learn from those struggles? And could you share those? I also ask a couple of other questions because maybe you're at this time in your life and you're like, I don't know, I had it pretty easy. Like I had a good upbringing. I was able to have kids really easily. Uh, you know, maybe you're going through your life and going, well, okay, maybe I don't really have like a major struggle yet that I've gone through that I could share as part of my story to serve the world. Um, the second question I ask is what are your roots? Where did you come from? And thinking about the answer to that question can help you come up with your story because we need more diverse stories in the world. We need more understanding of what makes American culture so great is that we are such a melting pot that comes from everywhere. And maybe you were born here, but maybe your parents weren't or Maybe uh, your grandparents weren't most, a lot of our grandparents weren't born here. And so thinking about your roots and how has that molded you into the person that you are? So that's another question you can ask yourself. Um, and I want to jump in and say, yeah. that, you know, for, for people to think, like you said uh, before about, oh, I've had it pretty easy. Well, the thing is like, I, you know, w it's not a competition. Sure. That's the purpose of this is the fact that what makes you unique I also, I, you know, who knows why we're here and, and what the purpose is for us going through these things. And, you know, there's some belief systems that you return and return and return to, for enlightenment. And so when I think of someone who says, well, I really haven't struggled, it's like, well, maybe you did. And now you are, you know, the path is getting easier for you. There's nothing, you know, so I don't think anybody should feel insecure because they haven't gone through anything. I needed that. I, I do believe that life will give you hints. And then when you don't take the hints, then life will slap you in the face. Mm. And I do believe that I, I needed that to happen to me. I've all, often said before my son was born, I said the transplant was the best thing that's ever happened to me. My son replaced that experience, mm -hmm. but my cousin Pam, I honor her a lot because I'm like, you gave me both. You gave me my life back and you gave me the ability to have my son. So I, I try to remind her, she's a very humble person mm -hmm. and she still says, I just did it because, you know, I could. And she said, you know, it's like an experience for her. And then she moves on to something else. And it's like, no, you saved two people's lives. That's heroic. And, you know, and, and she, you know, again, I think she, uh, well, kind of, you know, oh, well, kind of, uh, kind of, mentality but that's what makes her so special right is the right. fact that to be heroic to her is no effort and you know at the time family members weren't a hundred percent supportive of her doing that like because everybody's protective you know mm -hmm. my mother was protective of me and her family was protective of her and not that her you know my cousins weren't concerned about me but then it's like okay but you're volunteering to do this that could risk your life you know so you know it wasn't there wasn't like any animosity or any toxicity in that but there were conversations of are you sure you want to do this mm -hmm. you don't have to do this um and so you know not only did she save two people's lives it was a role but she did it despite people not supporting her in that decision 
because sometimes being a hero means that you are again on your own. So when you talk about the struggle, it could, for some people, it could be an easy struggle where I'm a good person and I do these heroic things, but my struggle is I don't have anybody that supports me in doing that mm -hmm. because heroes don't. Absolutely. Most people are live in fear and want to be safe and want everybody else to be safe. And to be a hero means that you have to take a risk. And as we unearth your story, so those are the first two questions, right? Where are the biggest struggles you've gone through? What are your roots? And maybe those are combined, right? Mm -hmm. And Melissa, your struggle in coming out could be combined with your roots of growing up in a small town in Tennessee, right? That's yeah. all part of it, right? It yes. all kind of blends Absolutely. together. Absolutely. Yes. And then the third question you can ask yourself is what lights you up inside? What is it that you do in your life that seems so easy that you lose track of time when you're doing it? You enjoy it so much. It never feels like work to you. It's the thing that it just flows out of you because everybody's got those talents and it could be anything, but you know, when that feeling happens where you're just full of light and joy, when you're doing this thing, mm -hmm. there's your story, right? What is right. that? What is that thing? And how does that tie into your story? So once you've started to unearth what your story is, then you got to figure out, okay, how do I share it? Right? So mm -hmm. the second part is sharing it. Well, and I so think, I think, I think the, in understanding that it needs to be shared. Like when you say sharing mm -hmm. it, I think for a lot of people, they still hesitate um, as if nobody cares. You know, the, it goes back to that, that idea of write what you know, when people are talking about writing books, you know, it goes exactly with what Jen is, is doing it. It's the, they say that because what you know is unique. And mm -hmm. so don't, again, it's not about comparison just because you hadn't had a kidney transplant <laughs> right. doesn't mean that your story's not important. Like it is it important. Is. Um, you know, I am sorry for the girl who needed the transplant to transform. I, I, you know, there's a lot of healing as I grow older um, of the younger self of my younger self, you know, because I was so uncomfortable in her skin, especially when I realized I was gay at 14. I was like, I didn't like, I, I, there was so much of my life. I didn't like, I just didn't like, I was, uh, you know, part of the disease within me came from, um, I'm sure my inability to love myself. And so, there's a lot of healing in, that's still taking place and will always take place for that, for that girl um, who needed that. So that's what I'm saying. You know, like, don't, don't feel, be self-conscious because you haven't been through something like that, because sometimes that, that means that, you know, I think you're on the right path as opposed to, I wasn't, you know, internally I wasn't, I was still, I mean, my high school friends and my friends growing up would, would be shocked to hear me say that because I still exuded the same personality that I still do, but there's a difference. There's a difference now where there's a, a more caring for me uh, as a person and feeling sacred because of that miracle that I was given. Uh, I don't take that lightly. I don't take that transplant lightly. And, you know, being touched by a miracle is, is, is transformative. And mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I just think if you haven't had, if you're still trying to define that, it's, it's okay because I think that that, that means that you're, you're doing good, you know? Um, so, so I think somewhere in the answer to those three questions starts the seed of your story. And I talk about this in the Ted talk that I've always had a gut check and we have this in radio and I know that you have the same feeling when a story feels a little too vulnerable to share and your warning defenses go up a little bit and they go, Oh, that's too embarrassing. I could never tell that story or, Oh, people are going to think if I share what lights me up inside that I'm bragging, that's too something. If it's too anything and you're tell it, your tweaks a little bit. That's it, right? <laughs> that's that's it. the Tell story. That's, that's the story, story we want to hear. Yes, that's you're exactly right. That's where the human connection begins. And you hear a lot of famous people talk about this, about authenticity. Um, you hear Brene Brown talk about vulnerability. That's what she's talking about is when your defenses go off and go, oh yeah, this one thing happened in my family back in the day and it really changed me forever, but I don't want to share it. Okay. When you've processed it and you are okay 
to retell that story. You don't want to tell it when you're in the middle of processing it, but if you've processed it like Melissa and you've grown from it and you could talk about a kidney transplant and the girl who came before it in the way that she does or whatever the thing is in your life, if you can verbalize that, then it's time to make that human connection and share it, you know, and be vulnerable with that story. Now, Melissa, if I ask you, how are you sharing your story? That's pretty easy for you. Right. I, but I, I did in the radio, I mean, radio world, morning show, podcasting, mm -hmm. but I have to be honest, I didn't, ex I didn't know that that's what was going to happen. Like I mm -hmm. didn't seek out radio to tell my story. I sought out radio to get attention. Like I was the girl who was so insecure that I needed, I needed the attention in mm -hmm. order to feel validated. And it just, I was blessed with being a part of you know, the two, the two first shows I was a part of, um, were with people who are the, some of the best in the country that I was able to cut my teeth mm -hmm. in that environment, which forced me to learn to tell these stories and forced me to learn to be vulnerable. And cause that was, that was not easy. That was not easy to learn to do that. It was not easy to go in front of that audience I would share, there were some times in some of these stories I would share, I would shake as I was telling them. And I know the same for you, but if you're shaking as you're telling it, then it's a good story. And kind of even goes to your Ted talk. When you talk about your mouth got dry and all this stuff, it's like, mm -hmm. that means that it was going to be a great talk because your body was responding to this anxiety because you're being vulnerable and you were being, you know, by just going outside your comfort zone just to do the Ted talk. Right. So put yourself out there. And I think I, yeah. that in sharing it in the way that we have so publicly either on the radio or on a podcast, there's other ways that people can share their stories in meaningful ways. And it doesn't have to be broadcast, right? It does not need to be on TikTok or your Instagram story, right? <laughs> right. Sharing right. your story could mean reaching out to somebody who is going through the same thing you went through. Um, you know, sharing your story can mean just with your book club or your coworkers. And I think this is a big missed area is with your customers. If you are a business owner or a business person in general, your story is what will connect people to what you do. Yeah. So finding your story and telling your story really applies in any profession or any family structure, any friendship structure, any community. In order to create community and connection, people need to know your story. Think about the products that you are loyal, like diehard loyal to. And normally those are local mom and pops in your town, your neighborhood, because you know the story of the people that opened the shop, how long the shop's been open, you know. And if you think about brands that are doing it well, you know their story. Right. Right. Like, um, you know, there's one, for example, that I can think of is Siete Foods. They create <laughs> foods that don't have gluten in them because one of the women in their family discovered an autoimmune disease and basically cured it by changing her diet and they couldn't find the products on the shelves that they needed. And so this family took their authentic family recipes, turned them into these products. And now it's a gajillion dollar business, right. Because, but I know that and buy their food products for more than whatever <laughs> the other ones are because I know yeah. their story. Right. And because their story resonates, it's a struggle they went through and they did something about it and they created something great for the world because of it. Exactly. And that's this. And that's exactly what Jen's talking about. That's this. So, you know, it's like redefining what is their story. It's storytelling. It's exactly what you said. So that's a great suggestion for people who are running a business to make sure. Because I do think a lot of times people feel like they need to be professional. And by being professional means that you don't you're not vulnerable or you you don't become transparent in any way because then somehow you lose legitimacy and it's the opposite is true right to be Absolutely. honest to be unique is what's going to make your business thrive and make your you know and i think of um i think of, of in our frenzy group the uh, the elder members of our frenzy family you know they want their they want to tell their story because i noticed in, in in with my parents like the older and when you get into much older years, the stories are all that's left and you want to share them. So I think that 
a reciprocal could be true. Like if you want a, if you want a good idea of some great stories, then find the elders in your life and just ask them. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do is just ask them, tell me what it was like in high school. Tell me what it was like to go through whatever you're interested in. You know, tell me, you know, tell me your biggest struggle in your life. Ask the same questions that Jen's asking to your elders. You're going to get some fantastic stories that you've never heard because a lot of times, you know, if, if enough time has gone by, they don't, the people who were there for the stories are no longer living. Right. And so they haven't shared it with, you know, or they have new people to share it with and they'll love to share it, but you probably don't know these stories about your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, that they are a wealth of fantastic stories um, that, that they probably don't think or anybody wants to know about, mm -hmm. you know, I think well, this is, Jen, I think this is, I mean, what a great concept for a Ted talk. No you're not wonder, out of the hot seat yet. Oh, well, okay. no wonder, well, I was going to say, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder that you're on the Ted website. Okay, fine. I'm ready. Okay. So I want to challenge you with sharing your sure. story more. Okay. Um, even though you've shared it on the radio, shared it on the podcast, you've written a, um, article for George voice for many years. Yeah. I used to write for Huffington post. So. <laughs> right. Yes. So you've been putting it out there. Right. I want a Melissa Carter book. You want to <laughs> okay. want a book. book. I don't know how to write a book, but I'm challenging you. Well, with that. What, it's one of those things. Well, yeah, you know, just, just you share your story. Just, okay. Okay. You know, just, right. just chapter one, go. Okay. okay. So that's, that's my challenge to you as one of my dearest friends. Okay. All right. You All got right. a lot, you got a lot, you got a lot in there to share. <laughs> and I think that it'd be really valuable. Okay. So then last step of the talk is about once you have shared that story and made that connection, and that's where you start to feel like you're living in your purpose because it's not the same feeling as maybe your other measurements of success have been right. So right. if, so then it's taking that frequency and amplitude that you've given to your story and allowing that sound and energy to come back inside and fuel you to feel successful. Mm -hmm. So that's really the part to me that's closing the loop is remembering that when you're sharing, when you're being authentic and vulnerable and you're connecting with other humans, I don't mean losing it on social media. That's not what I mean. I mean, well, social media is well, and, and you brought really that up a couple times. You know? social, social media goes back to my comment about needing to be seen. Mm -hmm. So before my transplant and getting into media, the, the, the meaning for me to get into media in the beginning was I wanted to be seen at, at, because of insecurity. Now I'm in media because I want to help the audience. I want to inspire. I want to motivate. Mm -hmm. I want to just convene with an audience. Yes. The I don't need is to, not the place for you to work out your therapy session. Right. It's I don't need to be seen. Exactly. To offer something to yes. the world. Right. And, yes. Yes. And so I enjoy media. It's my profession. So I do it because now it's just, it's something that I enjoy. I enjoy being on social media because to me it's an outlet of, of media um, but I think for a lot of people, social media comes from a place of insecurity, right? That's why you only post the pictures of when you're full makeup and when you're full, you know, like I, I got the pandemic totally. thing going on and I'm still on camera. I don't care. Like I, cause I love media. I don't have to look perfect in order to be on camera and I'm totally comfortable in my shell and being out and I, you know, and having, having this hair, I'm totally comfortable <laughs> with that because I love media where, I think that if you're the person that could not be on social media with your makeup off and your hair up and, and not being able to tell these stories, then your, then your motivation for social media is not what Jen's talking about. Right. And so what I mean about sharing is really connecting with another human. And that might yeah. be, that might be through social media. It, you know, there are a lot yes. of, a lot of people that are generous with their story sharing They've gone through something and they've put it out there. Like I think of um, Meghan Markle sharing about her um, mm -hmm. miscarriage that she miscarriage. went through. Right. And, but she didn't share it when she was going through it in July. Right. right? You she process it first, like Jen said. Yes. process it. And then following that, it was November that she wrote very thoughtful way for her story to serve the world. 
because mm-hmm. she's in a position where everybody's paying attention to her life. Right. So, um, so I do think there's great ways to use it. I didn't want to just like totally trash no, it, but, but I, I think also I don't want to right. encourage people through this talk or through our podcast today to go spew things out there that they're not ready to share. No. It's got to be something you're, you've you processed, you're ready to share it, and you think that it could serve others, then you're in a place to go. Yeah, I think in, in my interpretation, too, is that, you know, Jen and I, our careers have been in the public eye. And so we're not, yes. So it's not that you mimic what we're doing in order to do the same thing. It's, again, what makes you unique? What do you do? in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's how you should share this and connect with people as opposed to what we do. So am I still in the hot seat or is the book the last part of the hot seat? I'm just, you know, (laughs) I'm getting a little... Are you a little warm? A little warm. You did a great job. You did a great it's job. It's not a hot flash, it. but the, it's a little warm. No, I'm that's just the exercise to Jen, go I'm through. I'm so proud of and you. And to think, remember, right. remember your own success when you make those connections. Like pat yourself on the back. Give yourself that internal A plus that you are doing great in life. If you're using these things that you've gone through, or your roots, or the things that light you up inside, and you're sharing those with either people close to you, it could just be your kids. It could be. Mm-hmm you know, one child who is a little brighter because you shared your thing with them and help lift them up. If that's what you're doing in your life, that's success. To me, that is what is successful. Um, There's a, there's a um, satisfaction. There's a, there's a, to me, the difference in sharing whatever it is like here today, when I went through my transplant, when I came out, um, you know, even I, I serve on, uh, the Atlanta mayor's LGBT advisory board and we were in a meeting and we were coming up with some ideas that we're excited about for the city of Atlanta. And I said in the meeting, as they were asking, you know, how do you feel? What's the response? And I said, I, I just think of those people who aren't out, you know, the efforts we're making, we can't forget of all the people will never know how we have made them feel safe by our initiatives um, that we hope to implement this year, next year um, that we'll never know. And and the 14 year old kid like me who was so self hating because of the realization that I was gay, you know, for them to, to see the city embrace their LGBTQ family residents um, I don't know. I, I said you can't you can't forget the people that will never know who would want to say thank you and are saying thank you internally. And so I think that there's a satisfaction in that. It's a satisfaction in my efforts. Actually, like you said, connect with somebody I'll never know. I'll never meet, but it will connect with them. And so that's the status that. So to me, that's the word I'm trying to place on it is the difference between sharing something and connecting and the satisfaction as opposed to oversharing out of insecurity because you need somebody else's approval. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, a frustration, a stress, a tension, a paranoia. So there's satisfaction versus paranoia in if you're doing it the authentic way. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Agreed. Absolutely. So good. So good. So y'all start sharing your story to serve the world. Well, and, and and we're going to, yes, we're going to, um, let it, we're going to share in the show notes where you can see this Ted talk of Jen's that's so brilliant and we're so proud of her. So way to go, Jen, way yeah. to ch- help transform people again, that you may never know. I truly feel excited about the Ted talk because I wanted that message to come through me and land in your ears right? I wanted you to hear it and then do something about it. And so I feel like the biggest thing that we can all do in our lives, and I ask this constantly, is God use me. You Mm -hmm. know, God use me for what I'm supposed to be here for. And so if the talk inspired just one person to share their story and give it that frequency, give it that amplitude that it deserves, then God used me for what I'm supposed to be doing. You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Well, and I, I think that the frenzy is a byproduct of that too, because, you know, the, the guests that we have on the show, a lot of times we talk about things that they haven't thought about, right? They share things that, that nobody's mm-hmm. asked them about. And we're encouraging 
this safe space for older women because a lot of times people don't care to hear their stories and we want to hear those stories and we want you to share those stories. So the world needs you. That's right. Get it out there. So why do this? Why find your story? Why share it? Why feel that frequency? Why have a different measurement of success? Because the world is waiting for your story. Your messy, painful, joyful, trailblazing, ever-evolving survival story, it matters. Give it decibels. Go give your unique story frequency and amplitude to serve the world. And that, my friend, is success. All right, coming up, Melissa Carter has a pep talk and a mirror mantra for this week. Real quick, first, though, we want you to send us a voice memo with any questions or comments you may have for the show, and we can share them on the show. Uh, it's just a little app on your phone. If you got an iPhone, just find where the voice memo is, record something, and you can send it right to us. Jen at thefrenzy.com. Jen with two N's. Oh, and Melissa. You said spelled the right way. M-E-L-I-S-S-A. <laughs> One L-2-S is come on, people. At thefrenzy.com. <laughs> Shoot it to us, and we'd love to share it on the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the Frenzy Podcast. Leave us a review. Uh, you can, hold on, I've got that covered. You can also screen grab this episode, tag us online at the Frenzy on Facebook and on Instagram. And we thank you for your efforts. Okay, Melissa Carter, before we wrap up today, I'm ready for your pep talk and your mirror mantra for this week. I'm going to make it very brief because I think that, my goodness, the TED Talk is enough to motivate people. But I do want to give a different angle on success because if you are somebody who is struggling with money uh, right now or somebody who may have gotten laid off or somebody who feels you're getting underpaid, I don't think women have a good relationship with money. Mm. In general, I think that uh, women... Uh, have an anxious relationship with money, a scarcity mentality when it comes to money. There was a survey uh, done by my bank tracker. And I want to ask you, uh, I'm going to, I want you to express feelings about what I'm about to ask Jen. All right. So if I asked you, forget the TED talk and expressing yourself and all this empowerment, let's go back to okay. people <laughs> who may be uh, unaware and just a little insecure. And if I asked you to share your weight, with the audience, how does that make you feel? A little nervous that I would be judged. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to share your salary with audience, what what it brings it to my the I would face? Feel panicked. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you are normal, a normal woman according to this survey because uh, they surveyed women who said they would rather reveal their weight than their salary. Yes, definitely. And that it, and it's the exact opposite with men. Men would have no problem talking about their salary, but they would have a problem talking about their weight. And so it, to me, it shows there is a terrible relationship with women and money. Okay. There was a Viola Davis was, I forgot, maybe it was an acceptance speech. I saw something recently. And one of the phrases that she said was, if there's nobody like me, then pay me what I'm worth. Mm. Because for a lot of women, you know, oh, you're one of a kind. Oh, you're unique. Oh, there's nobody like you. Well, we don't usually translate that into, well, then can you pay me for that? So here's your mantra. Okay. I want okay. you to start thinking about your relationship with money. Okay. And I want you to know, and this is what you're going to say to yourself in the mirror. I get paid for my value, not my time. Oh, this is so good. I get paid for my value, not my time. You are valuable. If you're anxious about asking for a raise or asking for a certain salary or, you know, the, the thing about men is they know that everything's negotiable. So mm -hmm. what a man does is he goes into a job that he's not qualified for, but he's going to try anyway, and he's going to overshoot the salary range, when they ask him, what do you want to get paid? He's going to overshoot it knowing they're going to come back and say no. And then they're going to negotiate somewhere in the middle. So they ask really high. The company comes in really low. And then you find the, the middle point. Men know that. Mm -hmm. Women don't know that, it seems. And so when a company tells you, well, this is the salary, women never think to say, oh, let me think about that. Let me come back to you on that. 
and counter them with a higher salary. I mean, an inflated higher salary, not just a little bit more. You inflate it. So they're like, oh, we can't do that, but we'll, we'll come back to this. You, women seem to be afraid to say no yes. because yes. they think that the person's going to leave. That's it. That's, That's not it. how companies work. These and and I do believe that men in hiring positions know that women don't get it, and they know they can undersell women, and that is why women make less than men. It's not because that you know that I don't know. It's not because men are better than you at the job. It's because men play the game better than women do for the most part. So here's what you need to put in your mind when it comes to money. You get paid for your value, not your time. Okay. You are valuable and it's okay for you to tell that to the person that is hiring you. And so I, you know, and we, we are going to have more conversations about this in the future, but I just want you to plant the seed of money is not scarce. Money is not scared. They print it every day mm -hmm. and people have it. You may not have it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that you got to figure out a way to get it. So you get paid for your value, not your time. And especially if you're listening to the frenzy, you are so valuable. You have so much experience and so much uh, uh, knowledge that you are very valuable. And that's what you need to get paid for. I love your passion in this area. And Melissa's right. We are definitely going to dive into more money topics and we maybe even do a whole series on money. So, yes. so we can all get rich. Money is just one of those things that just flows. Let it flow to us. Well, and, and the thing is, you don't, even, yeah, you don't even have to, maybe you don't want to be rich, but you want to be comfortable. I mean, and the thing is, Money gives yeah. you options. Money gives you options. Money gives you freedom. Money gives you freedom. Now, if you get a lot of money and then you're not free, that's on you. <laughs> but money gives you the uh, the ability to be free. And yes. if you, and anyway, ladies, we're going to talk about this further, but please, please change your relationship with money starting today. I love it. Uh, is there a friend of yours who would enjoy this episode? If so, please share it with her. Plus, we want you to go check out our brand new YouTube channel. It is live right now with videos of Melissa and I doing the show together and also our extended versions of the interviews that you've heard on the podcast. You can mm -hmm. see our guests and check them out right there. We also want to say thank you to some of our loyal listeners. You guys are awesome. Thanks to Lindsay Lewis, Cindy Hilton, Mary Kay Wood, Valerie Randolph, Olga Rivera, Olga Rivera, <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Snyder. Thank you all so much for listening. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Soundtrack produced by Tammy Hurt for Placement Music, written and recorded by Placement Music creative team member Mark Daniels. The Frenzy's graphic design is by Helen Vickers and web design by Caden Jacobs. We want to say thank you so much for your time. We know there's a lot of demands on it. And the fact that you are listening to The Frenzy just means the world to us. And we want you to know coming up in future episodes, we have got some great guests to share with you. Melissa, will you tell everybody about the amazing dream expert coming oh up? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, so everybody has dreams and you love talking to your girlfriends about dreams. Well, we got somebody that's going to come on and teach you how dreams can help you help yourself. Like dreams are trying to talk to you about you, not about other people. So I can't wait to have her on. And an incredible executive who is working in the NBA. And she went from ball girl to the C-suite office. And she's got incredible stories to share. She's fantastic. And her mother's my new hero. And also we've got someone <laughs> who is a fashion expert who you've seen on the Today Show and probably on Rachel Ray and so many other places. And she's going to be on here uh, talking about being an older woman and how fashion is still in when it comes to your body or your home, no matter how old you get. And also a TV host and entrepreneur coach is coming up who has such an incredible story of survival. They told this woman she would never speak again. And now she's a public speaker for a living. Unbelievable yeah. stories to share with you coming up on future episodes of The Frenzy. So make sure you subscribe and we will see you again next week. All right. Trust your gut. Use your voice. Stop, stop lying, lying about, about your, your age. age. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>